On this week's edition of the Entrepreneurs at Scale podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Cameron Herald. Cameron is known as the COO Whisperer. He founded the COO Alliance and the Second in Command podcast. By age 35, Cameron had already helped build his first 200 million companies. And by 42, he'd engineered one 800 got junk spectacular growth, I think from $2 million to $106 million in revenue in just six years. And an in-demand speaker, best-selling author, uh, mentor and coach. He's shown hundreds of clients globally how to double both their revenue and profit in three years or less. Cameron, you're very welcome on today's show. Just tell us a bit about um, what it is that you do to start with around the CO Alliance and helping companies get a vivid vision. Sure. So I've, I've been working with entrepreneurial organizations, typically 50 to 500 employees for the last 16, 17 years. Um, I built four companies, got involved in a number of different mastermind communities. The first one I ever joined was called the Entrepreneurs Organization. That's where I met the CEO and founder of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. He and I were in a forum together. We then joined up four years later and built out 1-800-GOT-JUNK. I left that company 16 years ago. And then wow. over the last number of years, I started noticing all these amazing organizations for entrepreneurs, right? You've got the scaling up organizations and YPO and EO and... Vistage and Genius Network and Baby Bathwater, like there's tons and tons of groups for entrepreneurs. And then there's marketing organizations and, you know, events for engineers and finance people, but there was nothing for that second in command. So we started a community exclusively for the COO called the COO Alliance. And then I recently launched one that's for anyone who works in operations, typically like the frontline managers, directors called the Ops Spot. And I'm just trying to give those communities a place for them to scale and grow and network where they can grow their own skills and then also grow their com- their companies. I've written six books and um, yeah, just everything that I do is trying to help the entrepreneurs make their dreams happen. What got you on being, what got you into being an entrepreneur? I was great raised as an entrepreneur. My dad was an entrepreneur as yeah. were both sets of grandparents wow. and they groomed my brother and my sister and myself to all run our own companies, which we've all done for between 20 and 25 years. Um, I had my first real operating company. I was 20 years old and I had 12 full-time employees when I was 20. So all I've ever really known was, you know, being an entrepreneur or second, second in command to an entrepreneur where I'm really there building their company, but I never really was groomed to have jobs. Mm, Yeah. And you just talked a few minutes ago about the importance of networks. Why, why are these so important for anybody who is either as a founder, a CEO, or indeed to your point, a COO? You know, it's interesting. I was quite young when I realized the value of networks. Um, I was playing competitive tennis when I was a teenager and I was in this network of other high performing teens and I got to know them and their families. My dad was a member of a private golf club and I started working at the golf club when I was 13 and I got to meet all these successful entrepreneurs and business people. And I recognized that I got to know all the players in this small city that we lived in. And then I I would join a fraternity when I was in university. I was president the first year that we built this fraternity out. And so I was in that network. I got involved in a franchise organization called College Pro Painters when I was 20. And I got into that kind of network. So I started to see the values of these networks quite young. And then, as I mentioned, I was 20. How old was I? Uh, 29 years old when I joined the Entrepreneurs Organization, EO. And I had two EO qualifying companies and then met Brian. So it was in all these groups, I started to, to meet all these smart people. And I realized I didn't have to have all the answers, right? I didn't have to be the smart person. And, yeah. and I grew up in an era where we needed to be the smart people, right? You, you had to memorize everything because there was no access to the internet. There was no access to information. If you wanted to write an essay and you went to the library and the book was taken out, you had to change your entire essay. So we had to be the smart person. But I recognized quite early that if I knew all the smart people, they could write my assignments for me. They could help me pass the exam. They could help. I could study with them. So I or I could just hire them. And um, so I just kind of start, saw that value quite early on. Very neat. I want to turn now to culture. Uh, I know something close to your heart and uh, mm-hmm. the importance of uh, really discovering you know, some great values and whatever it is. So, 
first up, in your mind, why why is it so important to really double down on the culture in an organization? I, again, I noticed this when I was 20 or 20 years old, that if I could get my employees really excited and really inspired, they would work harder. I would get more results for the same amount of money. I'd get more results for the same amount of time. And it wasn't hard to work with them if they were excited and inspired. Mm. And I literally was 20 years old. So I had these, you know, 12 friends of mine that were helping to paint houses. And it was just me kind of stirring the Kool-Aid. And instead of holding them accountable and managing them and driving them and pushing them, I just lit a fire under them and it got them excited and, and off we went. And I had them excited about building the company and building the brand and where they would wear my shirts with a big logo on the back to the university bar. And I'd give them free beer for wearing their shirt all night. Like we became this cult. So I just, I just saw it as an easier way to do it. And then every company that I built, whether it was auto body or house painting or the private currency company, and then, you know, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we became these culture phenoms. And I just realized the value of, of that kind of cult-like experience. Mm. You know, at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, two years in a row, we ranked as the number one company to work for in British Columbia. And then in my second last year there as COO, we ranked as the number two company in all of Canada to work for. And I just saw the value of that cult and how you can attract people for cheaper, retention goes up, training costs goes down, productivity goes up, you end up getting the media writing about you, which doesn't cost any money. So culture just became a, a core flywheel for us. And, you know, you, you hear so often the, uh, the I think it's sort of culture, eat strategy for breakfast kind of uh, quotation. But I guess one of the things that underpin your culture are a sort of set of core values that really inform the rules of the game. When you were t those those organizations you just mentioned, how did you go about discovering your core values? What sort of process did you go through to make sure that they really accurately encapsulated the culture that you're looking to project? Well, I like I like this, um, the system that I, I got introduced to by Vern Harnish and Jim Collins, the Mission to Mars exercise that Jim Collins uses that you identify kind of the four or five kind of most impactful, important people in your organization, that if you can only take five people with you to Mars to start up your company, who would they be? You identify those five people and then you try to describe them. And when you describe them, you kind of net it out with four or five core traits that they all seem to have. Those tend to be your core values. What I then do is I say your core values can never be a single word, right? Core values have to be very short, easy to understand phrases that everybody understands. They don't need any explanation whatsoever. You know, they don't need any sub bullet points that you have to be willing to fire people if they break your core values. And for me, there's two tests to that. Number one, everyone in your organization has to be able to recite them, right? If the CEO says, oh, we have core values and you test the CEO and they stumble over them, they're not core values, right? Um, and I learned that from being in the church when I was quite young, which I, I'm not a part of the church anymore, yeah. but I remember having to memorize the Ten Commandments. Well, everyone should memorize and understand your core values. The reason that single words should never be a core value is they're confusing. Like, what does integrity mean? Or what does driven mean? Or what does, you know, promise mean? Um, so, so I like deliver what you promise, you know, be open and vulnerable, show respect for everyone, grow big, act small. And then the other one is, are you willing to fire people if they break them? Because if people are breaking your core values and you're going to let them stay in the company, it undermines the foundation and the pinning of your company. So that's the real strong test for me. And the only time I've ever let a company have a single word as a core value was a company that I coached over a period of four years from 40 people up to 600. It's called Blue Grace Logistics. And one of their core values was simplify. I'm like, oh, damn, that's good. <laughs> right? it, just, it really gets it. Like, it, it, and again, it, it, it's yep. so clear. It needs no explanation, yep. right? Yeah. And the other thing is companies have to be careful. They often try to organize their core values into some acronym. And then your employees feel like the acronym is more important than the core values. So you don't have an acronym. Um, and then really obsess and think about them. Like one of my clients had a core value and it was uh, safety is number one. And they had it listed as their fifth core value. I'm like, well, if safety is number one, listed as your first core value. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I tell you, that's how seriously I take them.
Yeah, I'm the same, exactly the same. And actually, when I first engage with a new client, I do just a test that you mentioned. I just have the board. Just just does it just by the way, just do me a favor. Can you write down your core values for me? <laughs> and you can see the blood drain out of their faces. I get the first two down, maybe. And then you can see them looking around at each other thinking, Darren, can anyone yeah. remember the third one or the fourth one? And you know then that they are really not living their values. And, and core values for me is only one of the four components of building out your culture. Okay. Right? So the first, if I think of your jigsaw puzzle, right? right the, the picture of the, the box of the jigsaw puzzle is your vivid vision. Yes. And then you have four corners. Well, the four corners are your core values, your core purpose, your BHAG, and your one year plan. So we nailed what the core values are. Your core purpose was popularized by Simon Sinek in his yep. book, Start With Why. Simon used to sleep on my couch. Simon was on our board of directors at 1-800-GOT-JUNK for a year when this was four years before he even wrote the book, Start With Why. So I got very lucky to actually understand core purpose and, and the why. And your core purpose has to be so clear that everyone in the organization understands why you're saying no to certain projects, why you're saying yes. They have to understand the drive towards it. And it becomes part of your cult, right? Like they're so... They want to plant that flag too. So at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, our core purpose was to build a globally admired brand. That's why we were doing what we were doing. My core purpose is to help entrepreneurs make their dreams happen. So my podcast, my books, my seal, everything I do helps entrepreneurs Beautiful. make their dreams happen. And it allows me to say, like, if your podcast was a government podcast or helping engineering contractors, I'd say no. But because it drives these entrepreneurial scale-up companies, it's a hell yes, right? Um, the third BHAG or the third corner is your BHAG, that big, hairy, audacious goal. And again, most companies do it wrong. Most companies have a number there. They don't understand Jim Collins right. term that it needs to be that 20 or 30 year stretch. It needs to be that divine def, kind of defining march that you're on. And from inside the company, it has to be seen possible. And from the outside, it seems impossible. So my BHAG is to replace vision statements with vivid visions worldwide, right? And then the fourth corner is your one-year plan, and that's what people latch on to. But culture emerges kind of from this model that I use, this jigsaw puzzle model. And then I also have the four sides that we don't have to go into. Yeah, no, I love that. I absolutely love that. And I think uh, for those of us, you mentioned uh, the Scaling Up framework a, a while back. One of the uh, key tools that goes alongside the one-page strategic plan is the uh, vision summary, which mm -hmm. encapsulates pretty much all those those the, those points that you just made there. Which brings me very nicely on to the Vivid Vision, which you have mentioned a few times, and it's a great book to read. We'll make sure that the ability to find the Vivid Vision on Amazon is in the show notes today. But what got you into writing the Vivid Vision then? So I, again, I, I've never felt like I was the smart person in the room. I've always listened to the smart people. Back in 1998, so 25 years ago, there were 120 entrepreneurs invited to a lunch in Vancouver, Canada, with a sports psychologist and he was the psychologist for the Canadian Olympic team and he was teaching us how athletes use visualization to perform at the highest level yeah. so an example would be a skier who visualizes themselves skiing the downhill and they ski it over and over in their mind or a gymnast who walks the floor picturing herself doing each step of the routine or a high jumper going over yeah. the bar they can see themselves going up over the bar in their mind so we started to understand how athletes did it. And then he showed us how contractors building homes take the vision from the homeowner and can create the blueprints or the plans to make it come true. And they can hand the blueprints to the employees who can build the home without ever speaking to the homeowner. And I realized then that entrepreneurs have a vision in their mind, but people can't see what they see. So Brian and I and, and another who was in our forum each created a vision for our company. I created it for the private currency company. Brian created it for the rubbish boys yeah. and so on. We, we kind of crafted what at those days we called a painted picture. I just found the term painted picture very confusing because people thought it was an image or a, a vision board or it needed to have diagrams and pictures. So about 10 years ago, I changed the term painted picture to vivid vision. And it, you end up crafting a four or five page description of what your company looks like, acts like, and feels like in the future. Now you can also craft one for your personal life. You can also craft one for your marriage. I'll drop links into the show notes if you want. Yeah, and share beautiful. these later. But the problem with a vision statement, that seven or 10, 10 word statement, is it doesn't entirely describe your company. 
even when you describe kind of your your vision goals or your vision traction organizer that's a list of goals but when you really want to describe your employees your meeting rhythms your leadership team what the employees are saying about your your culture if you want to describe sales and operations and marketing and it you need much more than a list of 10 projects so what we found was a four or five page description where you describe your company three years in the future not 10 years because that's too far out but if you can describe your company like december 31st 2026 as if you're walking around your business then everyone can see what you can see and they get completely aligned completely inspired they see value in their day to day and they start understanding how to make that come true for you so that was the purpose for building it so if you're taking a ceo through the sort of embryonic stages of helping them sort of really get clarity on their vision what would you be doing with them how do you help them to kind of bring whatever's in the neocortex or up here down into some of the words and descriptions you've just been talking about yeah so i mean i would get every ceo and entrepreneur to read the book vivid vision right because it's very well encapsulated in there i also covered it in short form in the miracle morning for entrepreneurs and also in double double um but you 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 lean out into the future so get out of your office Go somewhere where you're inspired. Go sit down by the river, up by the ocean, go up in the mountains, go sit at the golf club, somewhere where you're away from the office. Take a, a notepad and a book and start doing a mind map where you visualize every aspect of your company. So almost like you got into a time machine and you traveled out to the future and you get out of the DeLorean time machine and it's December 31st, 2026. What do you see? Describe operations, describe IT. Describe marketing, describe finance, describe sales, describe what your customers are writing about you online in their reviews, describe what your employees are writing in your reviews, describe the media coverage you're getting, describe your meeting rhythms, and come up with three or four or five bullet points for each area of your business, and then come back with all those ideas and write up a rough draft, like a Word document that might end up being two or three pages, then you want to give that to a copywriter and have them ask you some questions and build out so it becomes a four or five dot page document. Most entrepreneurs can come up with the rough ideas, give it to a writer who can polish it and make it pop off the page, and then add some design elements to it. So when my wife and I described our marriage together three years from now, we described our friendships, our travel, our fitness, our, our health, we described our finances, we described you know, sexuality, what we do for fun, what we do on vacations. We literally came up with a four or five page description of our marriage. And then we share that with the world. So it's about sharing this vivid description, this vivid vision of what you have for your business or yourself. And then because you share it with people and you reread it every quarter, it starts to come true, right? So it's a process of, of a manifestation. Yeah. But vision without execution is hallucination. You can't just write this thing and expect it to come true. But when you share it with everyone, everyone can see what you're building. They start conspiring to help that come true. Yeah, it just reminds me. I think it was the book, The Secret, wasn't it? That uh, yeah, John, came well, John up Astroff, with. John Astroff made the concept of the vision board. Yeah. Very popular. And again, the vision board is different from a vivid vision. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah the, the Secret really popularized the idea of manifestation. Um, but again, you can't just roll it out. It's it's. But when you give the vivid vision to all of your employees to your customers, to your shareholders, to potential employees, to your accountant, to your lawyer, when everyone can see what you're building, they start helping you make parts of it come true, right? Each sentence becomes a future state and they help you make each sentence come true. Yeah, that's gonna bring me on to the next question is you know, what, how do you disseminate this? But I think you've just about answered that. So what, what would you call out the benefits then of having a vivid vision? Alignment is mm -hmm. one big one right yep. where now every see when you walk into the office and you're like why did they make that stupid decision well it's because they didn't know where you're going employees don't show up making stupid decisions they show up making decisions based on what they can see but if all you're giving them is 10 goals you're talking you're saying that's a vision summary or a vision traction organizer or you give them your mission statement well how are they supposed to guess but if you can describe your company like i've described the coo alliance if you can describe it in such detail, they have that same level of intuition that you have. Most entrepreneurs think they're intuitive. They're no more intuitive than their COO or their VP of ops or their director of marketing. But the reason they're so much more intuitive is they're the only ones who see the vision. 
But if ever, like I have employees saying to me, no, we can't do that because it's not aligned with the vivid vision. I'm like, oh, fuck, you're right. Because like, <laughs> yeah. they can see what I can see. Yeah, yeah. I Literally, that's one of the reasons for reaching out to you in the show is we've just uh, witnessed the launch of Vivid Vision 2. Probably an organization that's got about 160 employees right now. And I could see firsthand when uh, they were just going through the whether the company's going to be in October 2026. That alignment, and but also the energy that brought to the room, and yeah, so the alignment and inspiration and energy, yeah. and then they need the plans like scaling up. Yeah. Those become the those become the blueprints and the plans to make the vision come true. And I think exactly that because you, those that will have followed the uh, one page strategic plan will know full well that right bang in the center of part round strategy is you know what your number is going to look like in three years time. What's the key thrusts and capabilities that you'll need to have? So I think everything once you get clear on the division, a lot of your strategic thrusts, a lot of your capability you need to build out the numbers are all there to achieve a three year sort of three year highly achievable goal. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I'll give you a really good, good kind of an analogy or a short story. Yeah. A hundred years ago, there were these three guys sitting on a sidewalk in Barcelona and they were making bricks. And they asked the first guy, what are you doing? He said, I'm making bricks. Yeah. They asked the second guy, what are you doing? He said, I'm making a wall and I get to make the bricks to build the wall. And they asked the third guy, what are you doing? He said, we're building a cathedral to worship God. It's the Sagrada Familia. And I get to make the bricks to build the left wall of the cathedral. All three of the guys are doing the same job, but one guy sees the reason of building a wall. The other guy is inspired because they're building a cathedral. Yeah. Which guy finds meaning? Which guy <laughs> finds value? Which guy is excited? Well, the one who sees the right. But if all you say is to, to build the cathedral to worship God, OK, that's your mission statement. But if you share your vivid vision, they go, holy shit, this is cool. I want to be a part of that. Yeah. And, and I guess also. If you don't want to be a part of it, that's equally fine. But it means yeah. you really have got on the mission. There's the people that you want to have on the mission and everyone else. Um, you know, you just touched you just touched on a core facet of the vivid vision is it needs to polarize. It needs to be written in such a way that it pushes away 50% of the people and it attracts the other 50% in. Almost like you know, 15 years ago, Steve Jobs decided that he was going to launch the iPhone and he said he wasn't going to have a keyboard. Well, a whole bunch of people said, you know, we, we don't want to be a part of that. We need a keyboard. Okay. Well, now guess what happened? Once once people saw it and tried it, they realized he was right. Right. So it's about, yeah, it, it literally is about crafting it in such a way that those people who don't aren't excited about what you're building, they don't join. Yeah. Yeah. So we've touched on the importance of having a vivid vision. And then I guess the next stage is once you've got clarity on your one page strategic plan is how you go about executing on it, which brings me nicely onto your latest book, The Second in Command, How to Unleash the Power of the CEO. So what was what was the sort of motivation then for writing The Second in Command? Yeah, it was really because there's no content out there to truly walk the CEO through how to hire a proper second in command, mm. how to onboard them, how to build a strong relationship. You know, we've got a, a book called Riding Shotgun that was it was OK, but it didn't really get there. And then we have Rocket Fuel, but it was really that was really about kind of a small 10 to 20 person company. Um, and it really didn't get into the real depth of it. And there really is no other strong content out there for entrepreneurs on how to hire this core pivotal role and then really build that strong relationship. It's funny, I was at a Vern Harnish event that I was speaking at probably 10 or 12 years ago in Atlanta. And I walked off the stage and this guy, Kevin Lawrence walked up to me, he goes, oh my God, you're Cameron? And I said, yeah. He goes, I thought you were a saying. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> he goes, well, people, everyone at the, this event of Vern's have been talking about, I need a Cameron. He goes, I thought it was like a flywheel or a BHAG. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're, you're killing me. He real, what, what they meant was they needed someone like Brian had. And I realized that I had this IP because I'd done that role a couple of times. Anyway, so over the years, I kept teaching people how to do it and, and we'd never really codified it. And then with the COO Alliance, I've had a few hundred members from 17 countries. With my second in command podcast, I've interviewed about 300 COOs from all over the world. I, it was kind of time to pull that content together and give it out. And the reality is all these entrepreneur organizations don't have any content like this. So it's it's mm. a good gift for them as well, right? It helps them out. So what does a COO do then? 
The COO does every, it's a great question. The C, this is why there's, a, there's such a hard way to define it. I talk about that in the book. The yeah. COO does everything the CEO hates. Okay. Very different. It's very different for every company, right? If the CEO hates finance, then the COO needs to be good at it. If the COO hates marketing, the COO needs to be good at it. So the COO does everything the CEO hates and everything the CEO is not good at. And the CEO has to be the right person for the right stage of the organization. So it's about the right season as well, because I was the right COO for 1-800-GOT-JUNK to take them from 2 million to 106 million, but I was the wrong guy to go from 100 million to the billion. Their current COO was the right person to go from 100 million. They're now at 450 million, but he would have been horrible there in the, in the stage that I was in. Yeah. So that's great in terms of what they do. But how on earth do you go about attracting and recruiting a great COO? The first is by truly understanding yourself. So if you understand yourself as a CEO, yeah. what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what areas of the business fill you with energy and what drain you, then you can craft a job posting for all of the stuff that you suck at, get a copywriter to pol polish it and make it pop off the page and share the vivid vision of your company and say, you get to be the person to engineer this growth. Yeah. Right. Here, here's where we are. Here's where we're going. Here's what the role looks like. Who's with me. And if you craft that kind of, a, and I, you also need to poach them. There's no great second in command that's out there on Indeed or Craigslist looking for a huh. job, right? They're working somewhere, they're building some company. Yep. You need to excite them and entice them away. And usually it's the vivid vision and the job posting that will help do that. And, and a great executive search firm that can help you post them. And one of the things I guess you and I both already studied is the book, Who by Jeff Smart. And I think I'm right in saying Jeff will be advocating both in terms of alongside source, but also getting a great scorecard. So what would I have on my scorecard is the key outcomes that are going to be to, you know, cl giving clarity that the COO is doing a great job. Yeah. And we've had both Brad Smart, who wrote Top Grading, and Jeff Smart, who yeah. wrote Who. Both have been speakers for the CEO Alliance. Um, and I've, I've known their work forever. Yeah. Again, because I've been involved in Burns organizations. So... Yeah, we follow the, the methodologies of top grading. It's different for role to role, right? For company yeah. to company. So if you're coming into a $10 million company that's trying to go to 20, the core responsibilities that you're responsible for are going to be different for a COO who's coming in to maybe engineer a roll up or to engineer a merger or to engineer an exit of the company. So there, there is no template saying these are the five things that a COO does. It's why the, it's why Harvard wrote an article years ago called the misunderstood role of the COO. And I talk about that in my book, the second in command is every COO is very different based on the roles and responsibilities based on the, on the strengths and, and weaknesses of the CEO and based on the stage that that organization is in. It's really about matching against those three things. So if you had some advice for once the sort of CEO has hard, a great COO. How do they go about building out their relationship in the first early, early months to make yeah. sure? Well, in the first 90 days, the COO's job when they're coming into the organization is to do nothing and uh -huh. learn everything. Right? Yeah. So in the first 30 days, their job is to observe, to meet everyone in senior leadership, to meet as many of the frontline people as they can, to sit in on sales calls, sit in on customer service calls to literally ride shotgun and to just observe and do nothing and write yeah. down all the changes that they want to make in the organization. In the second 30 days, their job is to test their hypotheses. So maybe what, maybe in month one, they're like, oh, we should fire Bob. In month two, they're going to talk to a whole bunch of people about Bob. They're going to watch Bob. And maybe they realize, no, they don't have to fire Bob. They need to move Bob into another role. Or maybe they said, oh, they want to integrate some you know, new, new CRM, but they realize, yeah, maybe, but not for another 18 months. So in the second month, they kind of test their hypotheses and they realize they've got a list of 20 projects they want to do. In the third month, their job is to do the easy ones, the low hanging fruit ones, to put the projects in place that don't require, as I call the PETA factor, low pain in the ass factor. So they, they don't require a lot of people time or money so that the employees go, wow, we just nailed three projects. Those were easy look at the results they're getting and they build trust and faith in that new COO. 
so that in second quarter, they can start doing some of the bigger, hairier projects. You also need to have some of that time before you actually start hiring people or firing people so that you have a base of trust of the people in the organization. And I think it can go very sideways very quickly if a COO comes into the organization and starts making changes too quickly. Yeah, no, good. And I often uh, will put uh, the COO onto one of the resources we've touched on a bit earlier on in terms of the Growth Institute. I think you did a masterclass there a while back about how to establish a CEO CEO relationship. And I think some great words of wisdom in there will point people to that. Um, so I think that just kind of brings me on now to part of what you do now is helping COOs and having the resources and the education and the community around it. If, it, if there are COOs on, on listening on, on the call, what, what sort of things can they expect from the type of services you provide now? Well, one is in the first year, it's gaining confidence in their role that they actually are the right person for the job that they're in. It's incredible to me, regardless of the size of the company, how many COOs show up with imposter syndrome. Wow. So the good thing is when you can get them to settle in and go, okay, I do know my shit. I, now I also have the connections. So it's connections and confidence in the first year that they now have 170, 180, 200 other second in commands that they can connect with and learn from and that they can shed that imposter syndrome and start showing up with confidence. We also teach them how to work with the entrepreneurial COO better. You know, most entrepreneurial CEOs are high quick starts or they're high D and high I's and their disc profiles. And they're very different from the COOs. So we teach them how to communicate better, almost like men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Yeah. That book could be written for CEOs are from Mars, you know, COOs are from Venus, right? They're just that different. So how do you build a high functioning relationship and communication systems to work well together? So we teach them that. And then it, it, in the, we kind of start giving them systems to put in place, but it's much more about the communication protocols and the confidence and the connections in the first year. Excellent. So Cameron, what would you describe? Oh, being... sorry, la lastly, yeah. it can be a very lonely role for a second in command. Right. It's as lonely yeah. as the CEO role is. The CEO can't go out and talk to their, their employees that they want to fire people or they're scared or they're worried. Well, the COO can't do all that either. And the COO is having to deal with these entrepreneurial CEOs in a very lonely fashion, too. So it's yeah. trying to give them a peer group for themselves where they can settle in and gain confidence to help them make their entrepreneurs dreams come true. One of the things I like re-listening to that that that, that masterclass um, was this notion almost that the relationship between the CEO and the CEO, if there are some dirty laundry that needs sorting out, is to do that between the two of them, uh, away from the board or away from the senior team. So when they come together, they're utterly aligned, even though they've had a right or ding dong outside yeah. of the board, or you know, I've had a walk and walk and talk through it. But making sure, just like a husband and wife team, they're not having a row in front of the kids. You're doing the Dirty washing outside. How, why is that important? Well, it, it's almost like the um, the mom and dad in raising children. Mm. Uh, mom and dad need to have time to fight and argue, but not in front of the kids because it scares the shit out of the kids. <laughs> mom and dad need to have their time to work through stuff, and they need to have date night. They need to have time to get away and build trust and relationship. So it's the CEO absolutely needs someone to say you're crazy or no or not now to some of these ideas but not in front of the team because that actually destroys their trust. But what they do need more than ever is someone behind the scenes to say, hey, I think you're crazy, here's why, or I think this is nuts, here's why, or I think this is good, but not now, here's why. But if you ever do that with a CEO, like if I ever said to Vern Harnish in front of his peers, you're wrong because of this, he would attack, he would get into a corner, he would go, but if I did it privately over a beer and I said, hey, Vern, this is something I saw. This is what I think he might not like it, but he would he would be he wouldn't feel cornered. Right. Yeah, great point. That's the same as any good CEO. So the, the job of the CEO, COO is to say the emperor is naked, right? The emperor's new, new suit, but not to do it in front of everybody else because you don't want to embarrass them. Uh, such, such a such a great 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 point just move on a bit now just to and changing tax somewhat i think uh what would you describe as some of the biggest challenges that you've had as you've scaled a business well one is that you know i can be a very 
I think I think any good leader has to be slightly narcissistic and slightly driven where we know that we're right and we're going to keep driving. Yeah. One of my pitfalls has been not listening to some of the team around me enough. You know, we almost bankrupted 1-800-GOT-JUNK at the 70 or $80 million mark because our our head of finance was saying, are you sure we're not growing too quickly? Yeah. Are you worried, blah, blah, blah? And we were like, no, no, we got this. No, no, we got this. And we didn't understand the cash. We didn't understand the balance sheet. We didn't understand cash being our oxygen. We didn't understand how to run a hundred million dollar company. We knew how to get there, but not how to actually manage the finances of it. So what I learned was if you're not willing to listen to your employees, either A, hire people you're willing to listen to, or B, start using your ears and mouth and the ratio God gave them to you, right? You got listen twice as often as you speak. We weren't willing to listen to him, even though he was right. And mm -hmm. he wasn't strong enough to get us to listen. So both sides, you know, it's not his fault, but there were two sides at play. We needed somebody who could ring the bell. So we ended up hiring a head of finance, Trish, who came in and she pulled the fucking fire alarm and woke <laughs> us all up and we went, holy shit, right? Um, like literally saved the company. Yeah. Brian, yeah. Brian had to go out and borrow $420,000 from his mom to meet payroll. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think uh, that notion that grows such cash. And that's a challenge again that you to bring in somebody as a finance lead is often a conundrum because you've kind of, you probably need it, the 5 million mark, but you maybe can't afford it. Um, but you're growing like Gideo. And then probably when you can afford it at the 10 million mark, then it's maybe too late. So uh, it's. Uh, it's sage advice, but I take out, you know, the whole notion of, of, of listening and being in tune with what's really important. Cameron, how do you stay on top of your game? Well, one is by, by surrounding myself and being involved in these mastermind communities. Yeah. You know, I've been a member of the Genius Network for seven years, strategic coach for seven years. I've attended four baby bathwater events, five mastermind talks events, two warm room events, a bunch of scaling up events. I've been a member of the entrepreneurs organization for five years. So like when you immerse yourselves in these other organizations mm -hmm. and you're around those people, that's one. I, I really spend a lot of time. I, I firmly believe in this whole year, the average of the five people you spend the most time with, you know, just, just three days ago, I had dinner with four fantastic CEOs. When I was in Kelowna, I'm having dinner again with four or five more fantastic CEOs and COOs when I'm in Dubai, I'm constantly placing myself in these rooms with other smart people surrounding myself with them. And then I, I really try to learn about what I'm working on now. I disagree vehemently with read a book a week, right? That's useless because all it's doing is spending time learning stuff that's not necessarily what you're working on. And by the time you need it, you've forgotten about what you've learned. Mm. What I do is I try to read and listen to, to content around what I'm working on now. So if I'm working on a vision project, I'll immerse myself in everything vision. If I'm yeah. working on budgeting process, I'll learn everything about budgeting. If I'm working on marketing, I'll absorb stuff around marketing. But I disagree with just learning for the sake of learning because it just it goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah. Right? We're, we're too bombarded. So I'm trying yeah. to learn and listen to stuff about what I'm working on right now. Yeah. I think you mentioned at top of the uh, the call around tennis. Was it tennis you're involved in? Yeah. I, I played competitive tennis and skied competitively. So what does high performance mean to you? I, I guess it's it's kind of being the monomaniac with a mission, right? Where, where you're just putting all of your efforts and energy towards the goals as best as possible. Yeah. If you had your time all over again, is there anything you'd have done differently? Um, I probably would have learned to delegate faster. Yeah. I probably would have learned to, you know, um probably would have learned more about the finance side of the business even to its basic level a little bit sooner um, i think I, i've wasted money in some areas of business over the years that i didn't necessarily need to waste but yeah. then probably getting faster because like at the end of the day if i was paying anybody who's listening to this right now if i was your ceo and i was paying you to do your job what's your effective hourly rate like if you earn a million dollars a year your effective hourly rate is 500 an hour why are you doing $20 an hour tasks or $7 mm. an hour tasks, right? I will, so I, I would have learned to have delegated to people to do the work for me at much cheaper than what I'm doing and what others are doing. Yeah. So final question. I have to slightly moderate it now because um, it will be, what is the number one thing you're focused on at the moment? Because it would have been, what book are you reading? <laughs> uh. <laughs> And so, 
of the question is what am i working on now <laughs> what, what book are you reading well i mean you just said that you only read something or listen to something that's what you're focused on at the moment I guess. Yeah, I'm talking, I'm spending a lot of time talking to the heads of other communities to learn what they're doing to build out their communities mm -hmm. and to um, retention in their communities, kind of the high value. One of the things I'm learning right now is the more that you give your members, the less value they perceive because they don't have time to deal with everything you're giving them. So when you have like the book club and the newsletter and the podcast and the groups and this and that, they're like, ah, oh, I don't have time for this. I'm not going to renew because I'm not using everything. So mm. if you give them two things and they use the two things, they see value. It's, it's yeah. almost counterintuitive. What are the two things that you're finding people are getting the most value out of at the moment? One is that the, the in-person events they're starving for, um, partially because of COVID, partially because our companies yeah. have become um, you know, remote. So I think they're starving for the in-person events. The other one is, is true connection, that they actually know the other people and they know the skills and weaknesses of those other people. So I think we're really starving again, that's connection, but it's, yeah. it's tr they really want to know the other members versus just, they meet them in the hallway or they meet them at the event or they meet them on a zoom call. Like they want to know them. Yeah. All right. That's probably we're, we're just starting to uh, run in person events again. Now it's uh, just starting to pick up to take a while for people, people have confidence to really invest that time. Well, you know what's you know what happens at the in-person events, sadly, is that the people that are your most loyal members that have been coming for years become mm -hmm. part of the inner cult. Yeah. And the new people, there's no way for them to meet them enough. And the people that know each other all sit together and the new people never feel like they can break in. Yeah. So it's our job to get them to know each other, like to really force them to know each other. So by the time that they leave, we've kind of forced them to meet more people deeply, right? Um, and then keep them connecting. What I can say is, um, as part of somebody whose mission is to help connect more people and help entrepreneurs, uh, a massive thanks, Cameron, for joining us on this week's edition of the Entrepreneurs at Scale podcast. You're truly somebody who I sense lives your mission and what you are putting on planet Earth for. So uh, thank you for your abundance today uh, and all you're doing. And for specific those CEOs out there, we'll put a lot of the resources that you are able to access uh, that Cameron uh, ensures that you're able to master your role um, to be able to progress in that way. So get, once again, Cameron, thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome, Neil. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Entrepreneurs at Scale podcast. If you'd be kind enough to leave a review, it will really help other like-minded entrepreneurs find the podcast and grow our community. Click on the subscribe button to be kept in the loop for all future podcasts and go to the show notes for additional reading resources and links to our guest. Until next time, thank you so much.